Uh, good morning, everybody. I see we got a few folks uh, joining a little early, and that's great. Uh, we'll get started pretty close to on time today. I want to get right into it because we've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, just wanted to uh, say hi to everybody and let you know that uh, everything's going well. Um, can everybody hear me okay? And could you hear that music that was playing just a second ago? Uh, just want to make sure all the, the uh, accruedments of all this stuff are working well. If you uh, can hear me, you can click the raise your hand button down toward the bottom and um, you know, or let me know in the chat. Uh, just uh, say, yep, could hear you. All right, that's good. Um, I will be back in just a few minutes, and uh, y'all just hang tight. We got uh, a full class and only about seven so far logged in, so we got more and more coming in. Uh, but uh, it's about five minutes till 10, and we'll try to start right on time at 10 o'clock. Okay, be back in just a minute. So while we're waiting on everybody to join in, um, we got a few minutes. If anybody has a question or anything, I'd be happy to uh, entertain some of those. Um, you can uh, raise your hand or put it in the chat, and uh, we'll go from there. Anybody got a question? Nobody so far. Put everybody on the spot. Now they got to think of a question. <laughs> How's the weather where everybody is? It was uh, it was obviously crazy all over the news last week about Texas and how it got down to uh, minus four in Dallas. Uh, today it's um, I don't know I think the high is close to eighty. Yesterday was I think seventy seven. So that's normal for this time of year. Um, so all of that crazy weather last week was very very abnormal, and that's part of what caused all the problems. Anybody got any questions or anything I could answer? Happy to answer any questions while we're waiting to get started. If you uh, happen to come in early and have a question. Y'all don't look at my messy desk behind me. I didn't, uh, I didn't bother to clean it up. Or straighten it up. Well, I did a little bit, but not that much. <laughs> and uh, if you're wondering, most of those pictures behind me, that's my daughter. <laughs> She's, uh, you know, she is my daughter, I promise. <laughs> she really is. Uh, uh, we got uh, quite a few joining in. Anybody? Uh, while we're waiting to get started here, we got a couple of more minutes. Give folks time to drop to drop in. Uh, if anybody has a question, you can uh, certainly ask that. I'll be happy to entertain questions. Um, you know, you can raise your hand in the the uh, attendee thing, or you can uh, just ask it in the chat if you'd prefer. If you don't want to talk out loud, nobody wants to talk to me.
Okay, got a couple of more minutes till 10, so. I see a few folks have come back. And Daniel, you look like you're in twice. Hmm. Is there two of you? Or just two people using your login? Uh, I see my buddy Bill. Bill McCaffrey's in. Hey, Bill. Let's take a quick poll while we got a few seconds to start here. How many of you have been uh, doing a photo booth for more than five years? Raise your hand. More than five years. Danny, Eric, Jack, Daniel, Carol Ann. Okay. How many have you been doing a photo booth for less than a year? Okay, hands down. Less than a year. All right, is that William? William's just got it, got a year under his belt. How many of you are brand new? Never done this before. Mia, Mia, are you terrified? <laughs> have you have you done any events at all yet, Mia? done for uh while we're getting started here i'll I answer a few questions uh it's 10 o'clock so we'll go ahead and get started so that we don't delay everybody else and there may be some more dropping in as time goes on uh yes all of the seminars are going to be recorded except for the one that i did two days ago i forgot to push the record button uh so i may go back and redo that one just so that we have it uh but uh you know everything is uh is recorded and will be available on our website probably next week. Takes a little while to get it all ready and put it on our YouTube channel. So probably next week we'll have all of that ready. Um, so uh, don't uh, don't panic and and uh, wonder where they are if you don't see them today or something. We still have one no one more seminar today at two o'clock. Bill's going to be doing that on printers and printer troubleshooting, and then tomorrow Eugene's doing one on template design. And uh, Eugene is really good at template design. He's got a background in graphics, and so he'd be a good one to, to sit in on. Uh, but everybody seems to be in. All right, let's get started. A couple of uh, disclaimers. First of all, this class is about um, basic lighting for photo booths and basic photography for photo booths. Okay? Uh, it's not technically about the software. Although, toward the end, if we have some time, I'll be happy to answer questions about software. But uh, primarily, one of the things that we get lots and lots of questions from uh, people is, uh, what, are, what camera settings should I be using? What, you know, how do I do this? My pictures are too dark. How do I fix that? And all of those things are photography. They're not really software things. They're photography. So that's what I'm going to focus on today is the basic photography of how to run a photo booth. So for all you guys in here that have been around for, you know, five years or more or have a background in photography as a professional photographer or something, um, we all know you may have a different way of doing things and there may be a thousand ways of doing something. I'm going to be focusing on several things. Simple, easy, and Remembering that we have a lot of people moving in and out that may or may not be completely impaired. So having a lot of light stands on the ground and cables on the ground may work great when you got a single subject sitting on a stool. But when you have people moving in and out every few seconds, multiple you know sessions going on, that can be a lot more problematic. So we want to stay away from those kind of things. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on is simple little, uh, you know, easy for people to understand that are not in a photography background because the largest majority of people who have a photo booth are not photographers. So, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get started, and I'm going to be using a PowerPoint for part of this. So let me switch over to my PowerPoint, and there we go. All right, most of what I'm going to talk about today is going to be focused on digital SLRs because they are... Uh, you know, they're going to produce the best quality image, but they're also going to be the most complicated to use. So I want to focus on that primarily and not webcams, uh, although Darkroom does support webcams and you can use webcams. 
but uh, we're going to focus on digital SLR. So this is a typical digital SLR. It's a Canon T6i. It's a very popular camera. The Canon series of uh, Rebels are probably the most popular because of their price point and feature set. Um, Nikon, we do support Nikon cameras. Um, the difference between a Nikon and a camera or a Canon camera as far as a photo booth goes is Nikon only supports computer control. That's the ability of a computer to operate the camera uh, in their mid-range cameras and up where Canon supports it in all of their cameras. So what that generally means is you can buy a cheaper camera for a photo booth in a Canon than you can a Nikon. You have to get in the upper range. Their lower end ranges don't support that. And that's just a decision that Nikon made to do. And, you know, we can't fix that or change that. That's a Nikon thing. So that's why most people are using Canon cameras. So I'm going to be focusing primarily on Canon, but a lot of this will cross over and work with either one, regardless of which one you're using. So this is a T6i. If you look at the front of the camera, and I'm going to be using my little pointer here. I hope y'all can see that um, on the pointer there, the mouse pointer. So right here is the autofocus switch. You see that little thing I'm circling? It's on the side of the lens. Um, that side right there, the left side if you're on the back of the camera facing out toward the subject. It's a little switch right there, and it'll say uh, M or F. And uh, actually, it's this switch right here. That's a stabilizer, which has no application here but this little switch right here is the autofocus switch and there's pros and cons either way for autofocus versus manual focus um, the manual focus is going to give you the most consistent results and the most um, quickest I'll put it that way because you eliminate the time the camera needs to focus so a lot of times people will call us and they'll say you know after my countdown there's this long delay before it takes the picture well, the reason for that is, is if you're using autofocus, especially in lower light levels, the camera may be hunting or searching to, to get the focus, and that can take a second or two. So <clears throat> to alleviate that, you can put something on the ground that's going to be a standard for the people to find, like a, a piece of tape or a, you know, a mat to stand on or something that you know that they're going to stand right there, and then manually focus the camera on that and set that to manual, and then you can um, you know, eliminate that focus time. It just takes the picture as soon as we send the signal. So that can speed things up a whole lot. But auto versus manual. If you're using a mirror booth, it's very difficult for most of these cameras to focus through that mirror. So um, manual focus is almost a must with a mirror booth. Uh, we don't control that in software that is controlled by the camera, the focus part of it. So... Um, you know, I would play around with that. Try either one. Don't wait till you get to an event to try these things, folks. Take some time, set it up, and experiment with family or uh, your kids or something um, and, and learn how to do that uh, when you, you have the time. All right, now the next thing I want to point out on this particular camera is the shutter release. That's right here where your hand would naturally fall holding the camera and pressing the button. Sometimes we, as a test, we'll tell people, can you disconnect the camera from the computer and press the shutter release? And they don't know where that is. So a shutter release is that button right there that causes the camera to take a picture. And that can tell us a whole lot about if the camera is functioning properly if you unplug it from the computer and press that shutter release. So when we talk about a shutter release, that's what we're talking about right there. All right, now then I want to move on to the top of the camera so that you can see a couple of things I want to point out. Um, over here on this side, there's an on-off switch. Normal operation, whether you're doing still photos or video with darkroom, is to set it just to on right here. Okay, not the video setting. Because when it's just set to on, we can switch it in and out of video or still photography as needed. But if you set it to video, that locks the camera to video and we can't switch it back to, to photo. So leave it on, just on, not the, the video mode, just on. The next thing you see here is this dial. Now, most cameras nowadays have lots of 
custom settings and specialty settings, um, don't use any of those. <laughs> the reason for that is because those custom settings and things, that's all these icons around the dial right here, they, uh, they in some cases disable the live view um, to you know, speed things up and things like that. So you don't want to use any of those kind of settings. There really are only two settings I would recommend for a photo booth. Now again, photographers in the room, I'm probably going to get a dozen people saying, oh, I do it this way or that way. But I'm keeping a simple focus here for people who don't know how to use the camera or not experienced with this. So for simplicity's sake, you would either want to use P or M. Now, let me clarify that. We're going to talk a little bit more in the future about flash. If you're using an external flash, you want to use M. Period. End of story. That's the only way you should do it. Set it to M. Uh, if you're using continuous light, like one of the LED ring lights or something like that, then P is an option. But for external flash, like an Alien B or some other umbrella type flash, um, M is the only way that'll work. Period. So just set it on M. Now, you can make a lot of camera and you know exposure adjustments within the software. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, but uh, you can't change two things. There are two settings that cannot be changed in the software, and that's because they're a physical dial or button. One of those is this dial right here. We cannot physically change that. We can tell you what it's set to in the software, but we can't turn that dial. So uh, that's one. The other one is the autofocus I mentioned a little bit earlier. We can show you what it's set to, but we can't turn it on or off. You have to physically flip that switch. So those are the two settings that you can't change within the software. So, excuse me. So now uh, I want to talk a little bit about the design, and I hope uh, hope this clarifies some things for folks. But this is sort of a cutaway drawing of the way a digital SLR works, and the SLR stands for single lens reflex. And so what that means is there is in the camera, if you look at it. There's a mirror right here, okay? That's, if you see where my, my pointer is going, there's a mirror right there. And then right here is the shutter on the camera, right there. And then behind that shutter is the sensor where it picks up the light and the image that's presented to it. And the lens is here. Now this up here is a prism, or sometimes it's a mirror depending on the camera. But basically it takes the image coming in here from the lens, it hits this mirror, flips it up here, and then out the viewfinder so you can see it. Now, when you um, are using this camera in the live view mode, then it looks like this. The mirror flips up out of the way, so you can see the mirror flipped up out of the way. The uh, shutter opens, and the image hits the sensor, and that's how the live view is displayed. So here, many times we get a lot of calls from people saying, I hear this click, and then a second or two later the picture takes. Why is it doing it twice? Why are we getting that click? Well, that click you're hearing is the mirror going up, okay? So essentially what happens, it, it happens real fast, but, you know, it, you can hear a distinct click. So when you go to take, go to the live view, it goes to this view. Then when you get ready to take a picture, it goes back here, and then back to this view again, the mirror goes down, the shutter closes, the mirror goes back up, the shutter opens and takes the picture, and then the mirror comes back down. So it's going back and forth and back and forth between this. And that extra click you're hearing before the picture taking is the mirror flipping up. Now, if you're using a mirrorless camera, you, you won't hear that. But we'll talk about mirrorless cameras a little bit later. Uh, but um, that's what that click is, is that mirror going up. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, autofocus problems. With autofocus, if you look through the viewfinder and you touch that shutter release that we talked about, you'll see, depending on the model of camera, a series of little lights, little red lights usually with a Canon, with an icon, they may be different. But you'll see these little red lights like that. Those are the autofocus points or sensors, so that's where the camera is focusing. Now, if you see a whole bunch of them like this, or they're flickering back and forth, maybe this one lights up and then that one lights up, then the camera is set to pick the best one for the subject. And that is honestly the best setting 
for a photo booth. Uh, you might get your camera manual and find out how to set it to where it uses all the autofocus points. Um, you may also experiment a little bit with face detect if your camera has that feature, uh, but that can be problematic if people are wearing masks or something like that. So when you got all the autofocus points like this lit up, then the camera can pick the best one based on what it sees and focus on it, and that's the quickest method of focus. Sometimes people will experiment around and, and they'll accidentally get it set to a single focus point. And you can see right here, like this focus point right here that I'm pointing to right there under his arm. Let's say you had it set to a single focus point and it was that focus point right there. Then it's not seeing the subject, it's just seeing that green background that it can't focus on. Or let's say, what if it were this one right here? Then it's just that white background that it can't focus on because it's looking for patterns and, and contrast to focus. So if you had it set to a single focus point and it just happened to fall in an area like this, the camera may have difficulty focusing. So I would check through your camera, read through your manual, familiarize yourself with that, and make sure you have all the focus points available to the camera so it can pick the best one. So if it has trouble focusing here, it can switch over here. All right. <clears throat> now, the next thing I'm going to show you is a little bit of an explanation on what an aperture is, okay? Uh, if you look in the software or look in the camera, there are uh, three things that contribute to exposure. Those three things are your aperture, your time value, which back in the day when I was doing this, getting started, it was shutter speed, but they call it time value now, and then your ISO, that's how sensitive things are. So to give you a little explanation of what those things are, the aperture is the opening in the lens that allows light in. Okay, And you can think of it as a valve or uh, like your faucet on your, uh, your sink at home. As you open the valve, it uh, lets in more light or lets in more water in the case of your sink. So you can see over here, and, and it's, a, it's a mathematical equation, so sometimes this makes no sense to people and they have a hard time understanding it. But the bigger the opening, the more light it lets in, and that's represented by the smaller number. The smaller the opening over here, let me get over here, smaller the opening over here, that lets in less light, and it's a bigger number. So a 1.4 is a much, you know, lets in much more light, and it's used for more darker situations, than a 32 over here. And you can see they get smaller as it goes down. So, you know, in indoors without flash, and you're living room or something taking pictures you might use this setting to let in more light outdoors taking a picture on vacation of a mountain or something where it's bright sun then you um, you might use this setting over here because it lets in less light so that's how what correlates to that opening right there next is is the is the uh, time value or shutter speed and faster shutter speeds freeze movement slower shutter speeds will pick up movement. So slower shutter speeds let in more light because it's striking the sensor a longer period of time. And uh, higher shutter speeds will let in less light and stop motion. So if you look at this right here, a thousandth of a second, that's the shutter is open for one one thousandth of a second versus a half a second. So you can see the image gets blurred as it goes slower. So these things all work together, these three things. And then, of course, you've got the ISO at the bottom where um, the, uh, the higher the ISO, the more sensitive it is to light, but also the image degrades. Now, let me give you a caveat there. With modern cameras that are available today, especially when you're printing a photo booth strip that's as big as a postage stamp, um, this is almost not a concern at all. Uh, you can photograph things at 3200 ISO or even 6400 ISO and still look beautiful. So don't uh, don't sweat that too much. Um, use this more for the situation, which I'll explain in just a few minutes. But that gives you some idea of what those numbers are. So you've got aperture, that's the opening in the lens. You've got time value, that's how long the image the shutter is open to allow the image to hit the sensor. And then you've got ISO, which is how sensitive it is uh, to light. All right, next slide here. 
So to go back over aperture again, because that seems to be the one most people can get confused about the most, a smaller or a bigger number lets in less light, it makes the image darker, and it's a smaller hole in the lens. Over here, a, a smaller number lets in more light, brighter image, larger hole. Okay, hope that makes sense to everybody. Now I'm going to switch over here to this next slide. So in the software, and I'll show you in just a few minutes um, how those correlate in the software itself. But in the software, when you have a camera connected, the camera tab will display like this. Now keep in mind, first of all, it only shows up like this when the camera is connected. All right, so if you look at it with no camera connected, you won't see anything. Or if you have only a webcam built into the, the computer and you don't have a digital SLR connected, you won't see this. It also varies depending on what camera you have connected. For example, if you're using an older camera like a T3 that does not do video, then you won't see video settings in this screen. If you're using a newer camera like the T6i, that does do video, you will see those things. So don't fret too much if you look at a video that we produce or something and you say, my screen looks different. It's just because you're using a different camera. But all the basic settings are there. The primary ones that you're going to concern yourself with if you're using an electronic flash, and that's by far what most people do, and that's going to give you the best quality with a digital SLR, <clears throat> Here are the ones that you're going to mostly use, and it's these I've highlighted. Number one here, that's what I was talking about with manual or uh, program mode. Um, with electronic flash, you're going to use manual, period. Uh, you know, with available light or with continuous light or an LED light or any other number of kind of lights, program is okay. But for the most part, manual with uh, electronic flash. Now keep in mind... Uh, we can't change this setting from the software. So from this screen, you can see what it's set to, but you can't change it. You have to physically turn that dial. Aperture value, I was talking about that. Um, that's a, uh, you know, a point there. And then time value is right there. And then ISO is right there. The image quality, you know, JPEG middle uh, to normal is, is, you know, a good size. It lets the camera operate smoothly, quickly, transfer the image fast, and so on. Now, if you're using electronic flash, you want the white balance. Uh, you can experiment a little bit with this to see what color you like best, but set it to flash or daylight. Uh, you can use auto if you want to, but keep in mind that auto will be influenced by their clothing. So if someone comes up and they're wearing a bright orange shirt versus a yellow shirt or a blue shirt, the color variation can be a little bit off because it's adjusting for their clothing. To get a consistent color balance where all your images look the same color, you want to use a fixed one, and I would use daylight or uh, flash setting with electronic flash, um, the, um, especially if you're using green screen. With green screen, you need consistency, so I would definitely use flash setting. Uh, but Daylight or flash will give a slightly different color cast, so you can try those and see what you want to do. All right, I want to point out one more thing here before I move to something else. And if you're using a Canon camera, Nikon, this doesn't apply. Uh, webcam, this doesn't apply. And this setting right here, external flash compensation, only shows up if you're using a Canon digital SLR. You want to check that box. Otherwise, your live view will be dark. Okay, this allows your live view to be bright and clear so everybody can see it, um, and it doesn't change the picture, you know, lightness or quality or anything like that. Uh, so you want to be able to set, you sure want to be able to set that to external flash compensation. If you see on Facebook occasionally somebody say, my live view is dark, my live view is dark. Well, chances are they're using a Canon camera and they need to check that external flash compensation right there. All right. Okay, now I'm going to uh, step out of this and step over to the software for a second. Hang on one second and let me get to that. Okay, so here we go with the software. And in this particular situation right here, let me point out a few things. This is where it's live. And in this software, you can change 
Uh, like for instance, you can set the aperture from all these drop downs. You can set the shutter speed. You can set the ISO. So here's what I'm going to recommend. Now again, you got a hundred photographers. They're all going to give you a different outlook, but this is what I would recommend for simplicity, good image quality with a photo booth. Okay. Use a single flash electronic flash directly above the camera a couple of feet with some form of modifier an umbrella a, a brolly box a soft box something that is large and diffuses the light we'll talk a little bit more about those things in a bit but uh, that gives you a nice soft light for the, the entire scene and it'll be consistent and easy to reproduce now if you start with these settings right here uh, with your typical Alien B or something like that. If you set that to the midpoint, most of them have a variable power. It's a knob or a, a slider or something. So set it to the midpoint, which would be half power. And then set your camera to manual, the AV or aperture value to 8, the time value to 1 one hundredth of a second, and the ISO to 200. All right? Those four settings right there and then white balance to daylight or flash. Okay. Now, um, once you set all those things, I think my camera went to sleep. Once you set all those things, then take a test picture. If your picture is too dark, then leave all these settings alone, but just bump up the knob on the flash a little bit. If it's too bright, then bump it down a little bit. Now, if you go all the way to the bottom and it's still too bright, then you can lower your ISO or you can go to a, a lower number here to darken it a little bit. But generally speaking, with the average electronic flash, um, you know, I'm giving you some generalizations. There is no one size fits all. It's going to vary a little bit with the room and the distance from the camera to the subject and a whole lot of variables. But what I would do is if you start off with these settings, aperture at 8, time value at 100, ISO at 200, flash set to 50%. Take a test picture. If it's too dark, move that flash power setting up to 60% or 70%. Take another test. See what it looks like. If it's too bright, then you go down a little bit. And that's a good starting point and gives you a good opportunity to adjust things. Um, somebody said the screen went fuzzy. If, if that's just happening to one person, it's probably your internet speed um, dropped down a little bit and it didn't bring in the full clear image. Um, but basically I'm talking about the, uh, the settings in the camera. It, it, it's probably related to internet speed. The, the camera, I'm not using a camera, I'm doing a software screencast so um, maybe it'll pick up in just a second it'll also be available you can watch it back again on when it's recorded and you should be able to see it clear uh, but that's all related to internet speed okay now the next thing we want to talk about is actual equipment okay I'm gonna minimize that and go back to my PowerPoint for a second and Okay, so there we go, PowerPoint. Now, this is the back of an Alien B flash. Now, I don't know um, how many people, um, you know, what flash units you're using. Um, if you bought a, a ready-built photo booth, it may have come with some other brand. Um, I'll be honest with you, folks, you're going to be hard-pressed to find anything that is more durable, more reliable, and more reasonably priced than the uh, Alien B series. Uh, one like this one right here, the, the uh, 400 model, <clears throat> is priced at about $225. Uh, that'll probably be the best $225 you ever spent. Um, I have been a professional photographer for a little over 40 years. Uh, 30 years ago, I bought three of their White Lightning series units. I still have them, and they still work just like the day I bought them 30 years later. So they are very durable, very reliable, and uh, I've dropped them and broken them, but I've never worn one out, <laughs> you know. So they are they're great uh, flash units and uh, do a great job. But on the back, this is that power setting I was talking about. Now, on the Alien B, it's a slider, okay? 
on any other flash unit. Um, it may be a dial, a knob, or something like that that you have to set. Now, on a lot of flash units, uh, when you dial it down to half, if you go from like full power and you go down to half power, that setting is going to take place on the second flash. So what I usually do is if I go down, I'll dial it down to half power, I'll hit the test button, and that clears out the previous setting and prepares it for the next test to give you an accurate 50% setting. So usually just kind of get in the habit of any time you make a change here, hit this red test button, uh, yours may be a little different, and that will um, clear out the previous setting and then make sure that you're um, using the, uh, the setting that you have set. Um, Mia asks, are these for a mirror booth? Uh, it depends on the design of your booth and how it's done. Um, a lot of mirror booths use a flash unit. The, uh, the mirror acts like sunglasses almost to the camera, so you really need a lot of power and a lot of light. But yes, this would work on a, um, a, uh, a mirror booth as well. So yeah, Alien B, I, I, I'm not you know on their staff. I don't get paid by Alien B, but I have used their, their equipment, and it's very well built, very good quality, built right here in the United States in Arkansas, and uh, so they're, they're very good. Now, um, there's various settings, and you can familiarize yourself with that based on your own particular flash, but you have a lamp on here for continuous light that provides, uh, it's called a modeling lamp, and that provides continuous light so that the camera can see to focus. Just like you can't read a newspaper in the dark, your camera can't see in the dark, so it needs light to be able to focus. So I would definitely have a, uh, a modeling light of some kind on so that the camera can see to focus. And so that's uh, that's a point there. Now, let's go back to my PowerPoint here. I'm going to flip over to this next view. Here's a different view of the same flash. It's made to go on a stand of some kind here. And this is a reflector. This is removable to accommodate whatever reflect uh, fly, uh, umbrella or anything like that that you're using. And uh, for the most part, this one would be the only one you would need. The 400 unit is plenty powerful enough for a photo booth. I wouldn't necessarily waste your money on anything bigger than that. Um, you don't want to burn your customers. You just want to take their picture. So the 400 unit is plenty big enough, and they're about $225. Definitely worth the money. Now, the next component that I would suggest, most cameras, if you recall back here, you see this part right here, this is called a hot shoe, and that's where the manufacturer makes a flash that slides into this. They're usually battery powered and not applicable to a photo booth, but that's where a flash connects, okay? So when you connect a flash unit or a, uh, a, um, a flash like the Alien B, then you use, uh, let me get back over to it, this right here. Now, the, the little disclaimer right here, I've been talking about Canon cameras, and I personally use Canon. Uh, this is the one thing that I would recommend you get from Nikon. <laughs> Nikon, this is a hot shoe adapter, and it's the, uh, the AES-15, and they're about $25 or so. Um, you can find cheaper ones. You'll replace them a lot more often than you will this one. And so the AES-15 is, is durable. It's, you know, long lasting they're not very expensive um, I would have a spare you know $25 will save you an event with this breaks so uh, I would definitely have a spare at least one spare uh, but uh, the AS-15 is is a great one to have and it slides right on the top of the camera right there okay now if you're at an event and for whatever reason your flash is not firing the likelihood, the high likelihood, is it is a problem connecting the camera to the flash. There's nothing in software that controls your flash like that. It's all the physical connection between the camera and the, uh, the flash because that's what's telling the flash to go off. A lot of times it's because the hot shoe adapter is not pushed all the way in. So that's something you want to check first. Your flash is not firing. Make sure it's pushed all the way in. Second thing you want to do 
on this AS15, this is where the, the cord connects that goes to the flash. Now this cord plugs in here, and this can also be a failure point, is if your cord is not plugged in good. So you want to check that. And then you also want to check it connected to the flash. Now on the flash unit itself, it connects right here. Okay, So it plugs in the back of the flash there. So let's say I'm in an event. I take a test picture and my flash doesn't go off. My pictures are black. All right, that's a, that's a telltale sign right there. Pictures are black. I'm gonna, first of all, I'm going to walk over here and press this test button. If the flash goes off, I know there's nothing wrong with the flash. The second thing I'm going to do, and this goes back to what I was talking about, that shutter release. I'm going to disconnect the camera from the computer because the shutter release doesn't work if it's connected to the computer. It's all coming from the computer. So just unplug the little cable right over here that comes from the computer and press this button right here. If it takes the picture and still does not flash, then it is likely a connection with the hot shoe or the cable connecting to the flash. So that's where uh, you want to check on that. Uh, somebody asked about flash intermittent. Two shots are fine and the third is dark, for example. Um, I will tell you that is almost always the flash itself. Uh, when you use a, an electronic flash, let me get back over here to this. When you use an electronic flash, it has a capacitor in there that charges up to a very high voltage uh, without getting too technical it's like 60,000 volts or something and then it releases that at one time to the flash tube and that's what makes that big bright light so what happens is if um, let's say you're using a flash and you take the first picture and it uses a little bit of the power but not all of it and then you take the second picture and it uses a little bit of the power but now it's used at all and the uh, flash can't recycle or build that voltage back up to where it needs to go for that third picture, and so your third picture is dark. So that's almost always uh, a situation like that. You can do one of several things. Uh, you'll probably never have that problem with an alien bee. You may have that problem with a lesser expensive unit because they just don't recharge as fast. But what you can do is set the time between photos a little longer. So if it's, say, two seconds, set it to four or five to give that flash time to recycle. And that will most likely help that. Um, again, Alien B recycle time is about a second and a half, so um, it, it almost never happens. But that is definitely a, a point there. Uh, but yeah, a little longer time in between photos will de generally solve that. Um, somebody asked Mia, what do you suggest getting duplicate cables for everything just in case? Absolutely. Uh, that would be the best $25 you ever spent in your life or $50 to have spare cables. I used to carry about 8 or 10 in my, my bag of tricks. And if I suspected a cable was giving me a problem, I'd throw it away. They're not that expensive they're just not worth messing with if i suspect this cable is giving me a problem i'll toss it because i don't want to get it back in the rotation later and have another problem and then i'd replace it and go on uh you can buy those cables really cheap they're you know usually just three or four or five dollars on amazon or something so i would i would get you know it's better to have many of the lesser expensive cables than one very expensive one because that one very expensive one could, you know, maybe a great cable, but if it gets run over or stepped on and broken or something, then you're in a mess. So absolutely, I would recommend you have plenty of backup uh, cables. Uh, it's always good to have backup of everything, but believe me, cables go bad far more often than cameras or flash units. Okay, uh, next slide I want to talk about. I talked about the AS15. All right, I want to talk about a, um, a modifier. In photography, they're called modifiers, but uh, they're, they're umbrellas. Uh, brawly boxes are good, uh, things like that. They're called umbrellas because they're an umbrella, just like the umbrella you use to keep from getting wet in the rain. Uh, but they have different qualities that make them ideal for reflecting light. So if you look at this flash okay this reflector is about eight inches in diameter and if you just pointed that directly at the customer and shine that directly on the customer it's going to produce very sharp very hard um, 
uh, shadows on the background, and you don't want that. That looks bad. It looks amateurish. So you want to have no shadows or very soft shadows. And so here's what um, you can do to do that is to use an umbrella or some other modifier. Now, uh, brawly boxes are great. I actually love a brawly box, but most of the ones you find nowadays are really big. And a really big one can get in the way of the camera and cause you know some other problems. Um, Bill Varenkamp, who taught a class yesterday and has another one this afternoon, uh, he has a 24-inch brawly box that I just love and borrow every front now and then from him. Uh, but apparently they don't make them anymore. The smallest ones I've seen have been like 42 inches, and that it's just too big. So um, a 32 or 36-inch umbrella is a great thing. They fold up really small for travel. There again, they're pretty cheap, about 25 or 30 bucks. I'd have several of them so that if you break one, because these little metal ribs right here, just like any other umbrella, they can get broken and, and you know, mess it all up. And so it's a very good idea to have a spare. Um, now, when you look at umbrellas, you're going to find the inside reflective surface. So the flash goes on this little rod right here. If you look at the flash unit, and right up here is a little hole that that rod fits through and locks down. That's a knob that locks it. So you slide that down through there and lock it in place. Okay. Then um, the flash points into the reflective side of the umbrella. Now you're going to find all kinds of umbrellas. You're going to find silver. You're going to find white. Um, you're going to find, you know, translucent that you shoot through. Um, the basic effect is the same. It's really a personal preference. The silver Inside like this is going to be higher reflective and therefore more efficient. You're going to get more light from it. The white's going to be a little bit softer light, but, um, you know, either one of them works just fine. I typically use a white because I prefer the, the softness of the white and I've got enough flash power to overcome any loss of anything from the silver, but silver's going to work just fine too. So any of those work, not a problem at all. All right. Now, Here's a typical lighting diagram, and I mentioned this earlier, for the purposes of a photo booth where you're dealing with high volumes of people. You know, you're, you're doing a photo booth session one every 45 seconds to a minute. You're pushing people in and out very quickly. You don't want a lot of cables and light stands in the way for a, uh, you know, impaired person to trip over. So if you had lights over here and lights over here and maybe background lights and everything else, it's just going to complicate everything uh, and, and not be necessary for a postage size, postage stamp size uh, photo booth. So what I would recommend is to use a single light directly above the camera. Now this is an aerial view, but you can see it's right even with the lens. The center of the flash is right there even with the lens. Uh, right here. I'm pointing at the wrong screen. So you see the camera's right here and the flash is here. You want to put this part right here a couple of feet above the camera so it's up a little higher. And then any flash uh, shadow is going to be cast down on the floor and not on the background. And then um, this is going to give you a good quality of light with little fuss and little things in the way for people to trip over. So good quality light like that. So the flash, you'll see the reflector is here. It's pointed to the inside of the umbrella. That spreads that light out and gives it a much more softer, more uh, even lighting across the whole scene. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. Now, uh, I'm just reading through some of the questions to see if they're... Is there a list of everything somewhere? Uh, you know, there's not a generic list because your mileage may vary depending on what camera you have, what flash you have. The connectors could be different. Those are things that you need to do for yourself and just figure out what you have. But essentially, there's going to be a cable that connects from the camera to the flash. There's going to be a cable that connects from the camera to the computer and uh, depending on what camera you have, you want to have multiples of those. Most of the time, they're less than 5 or $6. They're not very expensive, and so you can have plenty of those. Um, I would have, you know, like I said, plenty on hand. I wanted to show you, hang on one second, I'm going to switch back over to my camera. Here is a typical, I don't know if you can see this or not, but this is an AS-15. Can everybody see that? 
me see if it'll focus. There we go. That Nikon AS15. It's pretty small. They're about $25. Okay. So there you go. And then this uh, cable right here, and I don't know if you can see that little connector right there. There it is right there. That goes into the AS15. Now, it's pretty small, but it's got a, a screw thread on there that locks it to the AS15. And that's a real handy thing that keeps it from coming unplugged. So it goes in there and screws in, okay? And that locks it in there. Now, those are a little bit more expensive, but just a couple of bucks more. They're not super expensive. And that's worth it because then you don't have to worry about that coming out as much. And then this slides onto the hot shoe, and then it has its own little locking thing right there, if you can see that, that tightens down and locks it on there. But you do want to make sure this is pushed all the way in on that camera. So here's a camera. Let me show you how that works. All right, this fits in there like that, and pushes in, all right? So it's very possible that if your flash is not going off, that that may be just to slid out just a little bit, and it's not pushed all the way in. So you want to be sure and push that all the way in and lock it down and check that. Then this side right here is what plugs into the uh, the flash. Now this particular one is for an Alien B. If you have a different model flash, your yours may be a little different. So that uh, depends on your particular model of camera. All right, let's see. It's about 10.45. We've been going for 45 minutes, and I've been talking a lot. How about some questions? Does anybody have any questions? Um, pocket Wizards for green screen. Okay, Thomas, we're, we're going to focus just on what I've talked about because I don't want to get people uh, too confused when it comes to adding more elements like a Pocket Wizard and so on. There's a lot of variations and a lot of different ways to do this. Um, but I'm trying to keep things simple. So, in a nutshell, the aperture, the shutter speed, or the time value, and the ISO are the three things that control the flash. The higher the ISO, generally speaking, the brighter your pictures will be. So if your pictures are too dark, you can adjust one of those aperture value with a flash or with um, the... Uh, the ISO, the time value with flash should stay the same. It shouldn't vary that much. Uh, have you tried? Some people are saying they can't hear me. Are you possibly turning up your volume on your computer? How's camera connected to an iPad? Cameras can't connect to an iPad. Um, iPads use the camera built into the camera, and it's a webcam. So this is for a digital SLR with our Windows version. Um, Harder to find wired hot shoes. Uh, hold on just a second. Let me answer one question at a time here. Somebody says, uh, pushing toward wireless. Your thoughts on wireless? Uh, I use wireless a lot myself personally, but they will always be a point of uh, problem, you know, because you got the wireless transfer and other things that conflict with it. Uh, I would stay wired where possible. You're only talking about a couple of feet from the camera to the computer, you know, right there together. So a cable is not very long. Um, I would use, I wouldn't use wireless and they're readily available. I keep them on hand all the time. So finding the cables and the AS15 from Nikon, those are regular things that you should be able to get. So if an off-camera flash is firing well, then misfires randomly during an event. The flash is likely going bad if timing not changed. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say the flash is going bad, but you're cable connection could be going bad. It's possible that a barely connection may work at times, but when it gets warm or hot, uh, it, it breaks the connection. So those kind of things can happen. Uh, the first thing I would do if you have a flash failure during an event that's random is try, make sure that hot shoe's pushed on good, make sure the cables are connected good, maybe change those and see if that pr improves. Uh, especially if you're using a flash like the Alien B that would probably be the bottom of the list as far as the flash itself going bad. Those things that seldom happen. Um, pros and cons of facing the umbrella the other way around. Uh, pros and cons, you know, if you do a shoot-through umbrella, you're going to get a little softer light or a little uh, more direct light where shooting into the umbrella is 
a little bit more uh, softer. It's really more of a personal preference. And also with a photo booth, it's going to be more about space. If you're shooting through the umbrella, it might have to be a little higher above the camera so that it doesn't block the camera's view. So a lot of it has to do with space uh, more than that. Other than that, you're not going to see a lot of difference in the lighting. A uh, good telephoto length. We're talking about photo booths. And so, uh, in general, the kit lens that comes with the camera, the 18 to 55, is going to be more than adequate for a photo booth. Uh, I wouldn't be using a telephoto lens because then you're going to have to have your booth further from the subject. Uh, Built-in ring flash in the front. Is that good enough? Or should I have an alien with an umbrella? Uh, a ring flash is fine. Uh, they're going to be a different lighting effect. It's more direct versus the uh, the softness of an umbrella. That's more of a personal preference. A lot of photo booths have a built-in ring flash, and if that's what you have, obviously you can use that. The same exposure controls that I was mentioning apply, so shouldn't be a, a question there. Um, all right, I got one person. Roy's got his hand up. I'm going to recognize Roy and let Roy talk. All right, Roy, can we hear you, Roy? Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Roy. Right. All depends on a lot of things, where you're shooting at among them. Uh, let me go back to that image that I have of the alien bee so you can see it. Okay, so there, there's the alien bee. Now, this slider right here is what he's talking about. This is power output. I recommended starting at 50% as a starting point so that you, you have room to go up or you have room to go down. Uh, which one you ultimately use will depend on whether the pictures are too dark, how far you are from the subject, uh, if the room has a white ceiling that's 8 feet tall versus a black ceiling that's 20 feet tall. That can have an effect. So there's a lot of different variables there. But you can if you start at 50%, then you can go up or down. That, that's why I recommended 50% as a starting point. Okay, great. Now, can you have two of uh, the LMBs in any type of photo shoot or uh, point directly like you have this, this other one with the one? Uh, you know, you can have multiple flash units. Uh, for a photo booth, I don't recommend that just simply because it adds to the complexity and the, the potential problems. I would stay... Okay with single light for a photo booth. Now, if you're doing a portrait session, you know, when I would photograph a bride, I might use four or five lights to do different things, especially if I was doing it on a location and wanted to light the room and things like that. Exactly. But um, for a photo booth, just one is what I would recommend. Okay. All right. Now, let's say, for instance, if, I'm, if you are doing a, you know, a, a wedding shot or whatever, you have the light actually uh, one to the right or one to the left? Uh, depends on the there there again depends on the situation. But this for the purposes of this discussion and for everybody else in the room, I want to focus and stay on on uh, just for photo booths. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, all right, have a good day. Okay, now um, William asked, "What's a good distance for subject to camera?" You know, it's going to depend largely on the room. Uh, you know, a lot of times I would show up at a photo booth event and, uh, you know, they've dedicated a little tiny space about the size of a closet uh, to that space. And so the further you can get back a little bit uh, is a little bit better just because you can, you know, use a more moderate lens setting and so on. Uh, but about seven or eight feet, if you could get the camera about seven or eight feet from the subject and the subject about two or three feet from the background, not right up against the background. So two or three feet, something like that. You add that up, that's about 10 feet. Um, chances are pretty good you're going to get to an event at least pretty often and not be able to get that far away. And so uh, when you run up against that situation, uh, then you kind of have to adapt. But uh, if, you, if you could get the subject two or three feet from the background, and then the camera seven or eight feet from the uh, subject, that would be a good space. 
Uh, Angela says, cords, cords, cords. Absolutely, folks. Build yourself a little emergency kit, okay? Uh, have In that emergency kit, have two spare flash cords, two spare, uh, at minimum, two. Spare flash cords, spare um, camera cords, spare every cord you got. Every Look at your photo booth. Every cord that connects anything together, have at least a couple of spares. They're cheap. Uh, power cords. You never know when somebody's going to step on one and break it or something like that. So always have spares. Uh, the printer cable going, you know, from the computer to the printer, same thing. Have spares. Uh, put a roll of tape, believe it or not, a pair of scissors and a roll of tape. You, uh, you've got a $100 ribbon and paper there, and the ribbon gets broken for some reason. Well, with some scotch tape, you can roll it back around there and stick it together. Bill may cover that this afternoon in his printer talk. Uh, so a roll of scotch tape, invariable. A roll of gaffer tape or duct tape would help, too. Um I've always wondered about the utilization. Uh, Bill may talk more about dual printers, but basically with darkroom booth, um, you can use multiple printers of the same kind uh, pretty easily. You can use printers of different kinds, uh, but you can get some color variations and stuff from different brands. But if you have two of the same printer, basically, especially if it's a printer like a DNP that we support with a direct driver, uh, basically you just plug it in. If you've got two printers that uh, both have 4x6 media in it, then you can, uh, you know, it'll all alternate back and forth and, and double your capacity. And it's very simple. You just plug it in. Uh, let's see. Any other questions? Anybody got anything? Have I completely confused everybody? Again, I would I would recommend most people test things. Try it out. Set it up in your living room, uh, your garage. Uh, when I first uh, did a photo booth, the very first one, uh, my daughter was 12. She's 25 now, so that shows you how long ago that was. Uh, I set that thing up in the garage and just let her and her friends play with it. And then I would look at the pictures. They had a ball, and I got to... Uh, analyze and look at it and see what worked and what didn't work. And keep in mind, at that point, I had been a professional photographer for over 20 years. So the lighting portion of it and the camera portions of it were easy to me. But to find out what worked best for my situation, that's what I did. And then I did a few events for free for, you know, her school and, you know, Halloween night at the school or something. Did some free events to get the feel of how that you know, would all work and go together. So that's a great way of doing that and giving yourself an opportunity to get familiar with everything in the heat of battle, so to speak. We hear a lot of people that say, oh yeah, I'll try that at my next event. Bad idea. Bad time to try it. Don't try anything new at an event because you need to be able to produce it, not promise it, and then try to figure out how to do it. So spend some time practicing with all of these things and uh, figure out what to do. Uh, another thing I recommend people do is sit down and make a list of all of the things that need to work correctly for your job to be a success. Start with your car starting, literally. What are you going to do if your car won't start? What are you going to do if you can't find your car keys? What are you going to do in any variable happens? What am I going to do if my printer won't work? What am I going to do if my camera breaks? There's a lot of things you can do, but have a plan. If my camera breaks and I don't have a spare digital SLR, do I know how to switch over to the built-in webcam to get the job done? Things like that. Work through those things. Put together a plan so that you don't get caught at the event going on Facebook saying, please help me, I don't know what to do. And then you don't even know where the shutter release is on the camera. So put together a plan. Um... Would those settings help when your subject are wearing either very white or very dark clothing? Um, generally speaking, with a digital SLR, if you're using a manual exposure, then the flash is consistent and it won't matter whether they're wearing, wearing white or dark uh, for the most part. But if you're dealing with uh, you know, a predominantly dark situation, you can bump up the flash power a little bit or adjust your exposure to compensate. 
Uh, most photo booths use digital SLRs versus touchscreen devices like an iPad. Uh, you can have a touchscreen on a digital SLR booth. We're talking about darker booth for Windows, which uses digital SLRs. iPad applications use the built-in camera and not a digital SLR. So that's you don't have very little control on an iPad camera. Uh, let's see. Always test at the studio home. Always go in steps. Yeah. And and then you can work through any problems and, and practice working through a problem. Um, let's see. Roy, did you raise your hand again? I'm back. Okay, Roy, you there? You hear me? Yeah. Now, on the L and Bs, right? Right. Uh, you said be on halfway, and all depends on the situation. Well, that's what you start off with. Now, L and B has a, uh, to the left, it has the on, and then it has the track. And it has the cycle. Uh, on those, those, which button would you recommend that to actually depress? Uh, depends on what you want to do. Okay, on the back of the Alien B, the on button that you're looking at is for the modeling lap. So you almost always going to want that on. That lets you okay. let that kind of gives you a, an idea of what the flash looks like. Then the track button lets the if it's if it's set to track, then the the uh, modeling light gets brighter or darker depending on the power setting on the flash. So I would turn tracking off and leave it bright all the time. That's my personal preference. You can Your mileage may vary. Try and see what you like the best. The cycle is a button that um, causes the flash, or when the flash goes off, it turns the modeling light off for a second, yeah. and then it comes back on when the Flash is ready to go again, and so it's a visual indicator that may be distracting in a photo booth world, and people wonder what's wrong. Why is your light constantly brightening and dimming? So I would probably turn that off and leave it on constantly. Yeah. Yeah, that's your that's your modeling light because you, your camera needs to see. <laughs> it can't work in the dark. Okay, uh, let's see. I'm trying to skim through here and make sure I didn't. Um, Miss any questions? Any other questions or anybody before we uh, we got a few more minutes? Anybody else got a question? Okay, learned so much. I'm just reading through these questions to make sure I didn't miss any. Yeah, I can't emphasize enough having spares. <laughs> Man, I, if I counted up the number of times, in the 40 years I've been doing photography, I've never, ever, not once, had to refund money because I didn't deliver the product. Not once. And that was not because I didn't have problems. That was because I planned ahead, I had a plan, and I had backup equipment. Um, you know, able to deal with the situation and know what to do and, and instinctively switch to the backup equipment and get things going again. So never, ever, not once have I had to do that. Uh, I've always had a plan and always had that backup equipment. Uh, let's see, is the camera being triggered by the booth operator or is there a way to have the guest trigger the camera? The camera itself, when using darkroom booth, is being triggered by the, the computer itself. It's connected to the computer. The Software has a countdown, three, two, one, and then it sends a take picture signal to the camera. The camera takes the picture and then transfers it to the computer for building the, the uh, photo strip or printing it out. So the booth operator is not pressing a button to take the picture. There's a button to start the session, and that starts the countdown. Um, some, you know, depending on how you want to do that, either you can let the guest press that button or the customer or the uh, attendant can press that button. But generally, there'll be a start session button. You press that button, and then the camera starts counting down three, two, one, and takes the picture. All right. What's the guest seat to know when the countdown starts? Uh, in photo booth application, there is a countdown on the screen that they're looking at. They see it three, two, one, and then it takes the picture. So you may want to on the laptop or the screen or the computer, whatever you're using. Yeah. yeah whatever you're using. Um, 
you might uh, you know download the trial version of our darkroom booth software if you don't have that and try that out and see how that all functions and works any other questions or anything uh, Thomas has got his hand up hang on a second Thomas are you there Thomas Thomas are you there well, Thomas, I'm having, I'm hitting the unmute button, but it's not wanting to unmute. There we go. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Technology, huh? Yeah. Um, the file version, um, is it like the full? There are two limitations in the Darker Booth for Windows trial version. Uh, one of those is that it won't allow you to record video. So any video related things will go through the motions, but it won't save. And so you can't do okay. video red stuff. But, um, it, but it also puts a, a logo on the output. So, yeah. so you can use it, yeah. but it, it would have our logo on it. Yeah, so just for you to, to get an idea. Um, Correct. And I, it, it's basically the software that I use, like I mentioned yesterday, but uh, with Breeze. But um, you can also use your laptop with a touchscreen, correct? Uh, you can. Just there. start it. Just start it. Yeah. There's there's separate touch screens. There's all in one touch screens. There's every kind of computer configuration. I use, uh, I use the touch uh, mm -hmm. ability on the, in the software, and all I have is um, I see them through my monitor through the mm -hmm. laptop, but the monitor is behind the uh, just below the camera, so they get to see themselves. And all I do is I I operate the, the system myself. I just touch. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a personal yeah, that's a personal preference with a photo booth. You can have a lot of different variations uh, to doing that. A lot of a lot of people when they get in there, they they want to try to hit that button, but the the monitor is not a touch screen. Well, Thomas, in in your situation, but in many others, it is. So it it just depends on your particular photo booth and how it's set up. Yeah, it, it's going to vary. All right, anybody else got a question? I'll take one more. We're about out of time. All right. If there's no other questions, folks, uh, be sure to remember that uh, Bill will be back with us this afternoon at 2 o'clock to talk about printers, printer troubleshooting, things like that. I know that'll be very informative and help out a lot. Um, these will also be available if you want to review them uh, in, in a week or so on our website. Okay. Y'all have a great day. And then tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, Eugene is doing one on... Um, the uh, template design. So if you if you want to start, you know, getting a little more creative with your templates, Eugene's very good with graphics and uh, has a background in that area. So uh, tune into that. All right. Y'all have a great day. Hi, it's me again. If you haven't already subscribed, now is the perfect time to subscribe. Click the subscribe button down there. And if this video was helpful, I would appreciate a big thumbs up. That allows other users to, uh, more. it's more easy for them to find it. Algorithm stuff. Mm. But here are some other videos that YouTube thinks you would like. Thanks so much for stopping by. See you next time.